Well, good afternoon and welcome to the workshop. In this video, I'm going to try painting with enamels for the very first time, because after stripping the rust off the bogey for my five inch gauge locomotive, it's been sitting there risking getting rusty again. So I needed to do something about it and we're going to try painting it. See, those two dots and those two dots. And you thought I was going to forget. Getting this back together again, I've realised that I've not put in this bar, um, so I'm going to have to take it apart again. But uh, cleaned it all up and put it all back together again, giving it another wash in that uh, IPA. Um, so I think we're getting very close to it being ready to spray now and to do a bit of masking, but I'll come back to you when that's done. Right, we've got these masked up now. This is the etch primer I'm using, Upol Acid number eight in grey, one pack primer. Seems to do the job. This is my little, to me, uh, modelling turntable, but I think it's going to be uh, very useful for placing items on and then rotating as we go, like so. So, there's nothing to do but do it. I'm a bit nervous. Right, yeah. Right, I think that's uh, about as much as I can do now. Here we are with two coats of paint on the bogey and the wheels, and uh, over over the side there, there are some bolts. A bit annoyed because the masking tape has come away on the rim here on a, on a few places. So I'm sure in general it'll be fine, uh, but obviously it's going to be very noticeable when the locomotive is in motion because there'll be a lump which will move around as the wheel moves around. So. Luckily, I kept my compass cutters in the same measurement. So what I might have to do is put a disc on there of something and then use the compass cutters to cut a template and uh, then stick that back on and then use that to go around and uh, chip off any paint that's gone over the edges. Okay, the paint from Phoenix has finally arrived and after the nosebleed at paint paying almost £100 for four pots of paint and some thinners, um, I finally recovered enough to talk about it. So this is the Southeastern and Chatham locomotive scheme, essentially. This is loco green. So this is the color that the, the actual main body of the locomotive will be in the boiler and so on. It's a bit more blue than any uh, greens you might have seen, well, not any, but most greens you will have seen in a locomotive, especially British Railways green. It's a lot more yellow and this is a lot more blue. Um, and what's also quite distinctive about the Southeastern and Chatham locos is everything underneath the footboard, or under the footplate, sorry, um, is this kind of Indian red. Um, so uh, you're going to have this green at the top and this brown underneath, which I think is going to be really, it's going to really draw your eye. You're not going to be, not going to be bored at all. Um, this black is for things like brake linkages, and this red is for the buffer beams and the inside of the frames. So the inside it will be vermilion and the outside is this Indian red. I've also got uh, a little tester pot of this. This is Midland Railway lining straw. And the idea is that I will use that to try and line out the local. You might be wondering why I'm back at the milling machine. And that's because way back when I machined this, I said I was going to make this pin exactly to the drawings. Um, because I didn't want to have two parts that were wrong. I never actually got around to correcting this part. I went straight for the painting. <laughs> so, unfortunately, I now need to take some off of here in order that when I screw this down, there's still a little bit of movement. There needs to be a sixteenth of an inch clearance between the bottom of this nut and the top of this surface here. Well, I figured while I've got a ball nose end mill available to me, I may as well you try and use it to tidy up these corners. Um, it's got no functional use, nothing registers against this face. But hey, you know, we're here, why not?
Well, while we're waiting for the paint to dry, and it's taking a long time, it needs to be about 12 or 18 hours between coats to harden up, I thought, let's finish off the bogey bolster at the same time. You may have wondered why I was trying to eyeball these holes, and it, which has worked out okay. Uh, and that's because I spotted them through from the frames, as you saw, and so there was nothing to say that these were in a straight line. So I didn't just want to move the, the x-axis on my milling machine and just drill straight through, because if these were offset from each other, then those holes wouldn't match up. So, Additionally, I didn't have enough headroom on the mill to be able to tap, put a tap follower in and, uh, and tap in the mill. Uh, so maybe I need to make a tapping head. Um, but I can use the frames here as a tapping guide. So uh, I'll use that and just go in there and tap these holes, get this bolted up and we can see what it looks like. Well, there we go. The bolster is finally in place all holes tapped perpendicular central went in like an absolute glove couldn't be happier with that the second coat of the reds just gone on with the modified bogey stretcher there and i'm really liking how vibrant that is first coat of indian red what you can see here is the the bogey all painted up i've reassembled it um, you can see my masking didn't really work here but i'm just going to go around and tidy this up by hand i think it's no big deal um, or I could even sand this bit down and just repaint the whole rim in, in the green. But hopefully you can see what I was going for. Um, it rolls real nice, as you can see. Turns out you need to oil these things, who would have thought? <laughs> uh, I've also put some springs in there. So it has got a little bit of springing, uh, but it's nowhere near enough, really, for the weight of the locomotive. I misread the spec on the spring. So with that, and if I pan you over to here, the bogey bolster. Um, I think we can probably consider what we've done in this video a success. Um, having had the frames assembled like this, I've been looking down them, and I can definitely see, if I zoom out, I can definitely see that the top of this uh, horn slot is higher than the top of this horn slot. Uh, and in addition, the buffer beam right at the very end is, uh, is completely out uh, by comparison to the front. So... I don't think the saga of the frames is quite finished yet, uh, but certainly enough for us to call this video to a close. So thank you all for watching, and I will see you next time.